today who are going to be talking about St. John Newman, and his feast day is January 5th. Our topics for the day are our opening prayer. We'll do a little overview of his early life and education. We'll talk a little bit about his seminary studies, how he made it to America, his priesthood, how he became Bishop of Philadelphia, talk a little bit about veneration in St. Peter the Apostle Church, talk a little bit about how or what he is as far as a saint, patron saint is concerned, and then we'll do our closing prayer. Our opening prayer, O Jesus, who on earth commanded and practiced a hidden life, grant that in these our days of pride and outward display, the example of your servant, John Newman, may lead us to follow your humble ways. Amen. Our overview, John Newman was born in Prachatis in Bohemia, which is now the Czech Republic, on March 28th of 1811. He immigrated to the United States in 1836, where he was later ordained and became a member of the Redemptorist Order. He also became the fourth Bishop of Philadelphia. While he was Bishop of Philadelphia, he founded the first Catholic diocesan school system in the United States. In prior Stellar Saints, we talked about a little bit about uh, Elizabeth Ann Seton. And Elizabeth Ann Seton did found the first Catholic school in the United States, but it wasn't Catholic diocesan school system. And so there is a distinction between those two. He died January 5th of 1860 at the age of 48. He is the first United States Bishop and to date, the only male US citizen to be canonized. He was canonized in 1977. His father was a stocking knitter from Germany who moved to Pray Chattis in 1802 at the age of 28. And he married his first wife, Antonia. Antonia died in childbirth as did the infant in November of 1804. So Philip later married the daughter of a harness maker, Agnes, on July 17th of 1805. John was the third of their six children, Catherine, Veronica, John, Joan, Louise, and Wenceslas. And there's two pictures there of John's father and his mother. Now back in the 1800s, having your picture taken was really re reserved for only the people who were more or less affluent. And while his parents weren't very, very rich, they were wealthy enough to be able to support a very nice lifestyle. Newman was baptized in the village church on the very same day that he was born. And he did go to the town school when he was six. He was a very studious, hardworking child, and he did enjoy reading, and he had a love of books. Because at the time, Prochetus was under the Austrian monarchy, German was the spoken language at home and school. So John was not really acquainted with Czech at the time. So he started school and four years later, his parents did tell him that they were certainly prepared to allow him to continue his studies after grammar schools. Again, back in the 1800s, most children, if they were in school at all, only went for a few years, and then they had to drop out of school to begin to work in order to help support the parents. However, in Newman's case, his parents did have uh, enough money to be able to let him continue his education. So during that same time, there was a catechist who helped prepare boys to pursue higher studies by offering them evening lessons in Latin. 
And Newman did attend that with eight or 10 other boys for the last two years of his term in grammar school. After he completed grammar school in the autumn of 1823, Newman passed the entrance examinations with distinction for a school in Budweiss, which was operated by the Pariatist fathers. He entered the school in a class of 103 students, whom less than 50 ultimately completed the six-year course. The curriculum was kind of rigorous, and it included Latin and mathematics, geography, history, Christian doctrine for the first four years. And then in the last two years, it was devoted to Latin and Greek classical authors. So in the middle of his third year, Newman's professor was dismissed for appearing before a public gathering while he was drunk, and he was replaced by a much stricter instructor. And the new instructor had a different way of teaching the children, and he believed in rote learning. Newman really didn't care for rote learning, and so he didn't do quite as well under the new instructor, but he wasn't the only boy who didn't do well. Many of the students found that the new curriculum was much more fast paced, so 20 of his classmates dropped out. He did persevere and he passed his examinations with a fair average. However, he really didn't like that. He wanted to be a better student. So after completing the course of study in 1829, he began two years of study in philosophy in the same building, but under different instructors. His new instructors were Cistercian monks, monks from the local abbey. Newman attained a better than fair average in a number of very complex studies, and he did overcome his earlier weakness in mathematics. He loved the sciences, particularly botany and astronomy, so he did form a club with his fellow students where they discuss these subjects in their spare time. Upon graduating in the summer of 1831, he wasn't quite sure, like many children, what he wanted to become. So there was a decision between a physician, a lawyer, or a priest. And because he had a particular taste for sciences and poetry, more so than theology, and he was a little discouraged about having to enter the seminary because again, back in those days, it was particularly difficult to be accepted into the seminary unless you had some very influential friends uh, to recommend you. So he decided that maybe studying medicine was the best thing for him. And his father certainly agreed and was prepared to pay the tuition for him to go to medical school. His mother, however, really thought that his desire was to become a priest, and she encouraged him to apply to the seminary, even though he wouldn't have the testimonials uh, from the influential pe people. But he applied anyway, and he was accepted. So he entered the seminary of the Diocese of Budweiss on November 1st, 1831. He spent his first two years studying theology, and they were great days for him. He enjoyed all of the different things that he had to study. Did a lot of studying in the Old Testament in his first year, and he received the highest possible grades in all of his studies, including his diligence and conduct. At the end of his first year, he was one of the few men in his class that were permitted to take tonsure and minor orders. In his second year at Budweiss, he studied a lot of other things that he had to do with canon law. Again, his grades were very, very good. He received the highest grades in every subject except, except in one semester when he received the second highest possible grade. 
great. However, it was a really complex course. Now in his spare time, he began to study French and he worked to improve his command of Italian, which he had started to learn during his philosophy course. And he did want to learn his native language of Czech. In his second year of studying theology, he began to read reports of the Lepolidine Society on the need for priests in the United States, especially to serve German speaking communities there. At this particular time in history, Germans were leaving and coming into the United States in great numbers. And he was further inspired by a lecture that was given by the director of the seminary on missionary activities of Paul the Apostle. So Newman and his friend, Adelbert Schmidt, both made up their minds that they were going to devote their lives to the missions after they had completed their seminary studies. Newman's intention to go to America made it necessary for him to learn English. However, there really weren't a lot of opportunities to learn English in Budweiss. However, the Bishop of Budweiss had a privilege of sending two of his seminarians each year to study at the University of Prague. And because Newman's grades were so good in the spring of 33, Newman petitioned the Bishop to, con to continue his study and he hoped to learn French and English at the University of Prague. So he did go there. However, the state imposed regulations a year later that forbid seminarians to go out except for four hours a week. They could take walks anywhere they wanted, two hours on a Tuesday and two hours on a Thursday, but that really precluded him from attending the different lectures every single day. However, he continued to study French independently. And when he presented himself for his exam, he did manage to pass with a very high grade, despite not having attended the lectures. He was disappointed to find out that the university didn't offer classes in English. So again, he studied independently from a book and he started to engage in conversation with people who spoke English. And after a year, he was capable of writing portions in his diary in English. In his final year at Prague, he was able to use German, Czech, French, English, Spanish, and Italian, as well as Latin and Greek. And that came in very handy later in his career. Now his friend, Adelbert Schmidt, was also continuing his studies in Budweiss and he did plan to go with Newman as a missionary. And he happened to mention this to his confessor, who was Father Dictal. Dictal encouraged the plan and thought to send Newman to the Diocese of Philadelphia. Dictal had received a letter from a coagitator, Bishop Francis Kenrick, asking if he had two German priests. And Dictal had learned of this through correspondence with Andrew Ross, who was the director of the seminary in Strasbourg. However, the correspondence between Europe and America was slow, and so he never really got a definite response regarding Newman if he would be welcomed in Philadelphia. So now Newman expects to be ordained to the priesthood by Bishop Rosaka at the end of the academic year. But on June 10th, he became seriously ill. And Newman returned to Budweiss for his conical examination for the priesthood and successfully passed, but the ordin ordination was delayed because of the bishop's illness. And they were ultimately canceled because the diocese of Budweiss had too many priests. They already had priests who were lacking any assignments and they didn't feel the need to ordain new priests and take on the burden of their support 
without having any parishes or any place for them to go. So Newman was a little upset because he really wanted to be ordained prior to leaving for America. Because back in those days, the minute you were ordained, you gave it, uh, your first blessing to your parents. And just like today, you wanted your family present at your first mass. So he started on his journey to Philadelphia because Father Dictil still wanted to send both Schmidt and Newman to Philly. But there really wasn't any money. They barely had money for one person to go. And the Leopoldine Society was unwilling to provide financial support for that trip without knowing whether or not Newman would actually be ordained and would actually be able to be of some use in Philadelphia. So Newman decided to start his journey alone without the support of the society. So he didn't tell anyone except his one sister, Veronica, that he was leaving. And his mother thought he was leaving only for a visit to the Budweiss. So he traveled to Munich where he was introduced to a man by the name of John Henney. And John told, John Henney told him that there, a German priest wasn't needed anymore in Philadelphia. However, there were other dioceses like Detroit and New York that may be in need of a German priest. However, it's very difficult to travel to a new country without dismissorial letters. You have to be able to prove your background and your seminary studies and that someone really wants you. But the next morning, a professor at the University of Munich advised Newman to get in touch with Bishop Simone Bronte of Vincenzes. Now, Bishop Bronte was in Europe recruiting missionaries. And Father Henry gave Newman Bishop Bronte's address in Paris because they expected Bishop Bronte to be in Paris around Easter. So Newman decided that he was going to travel to Paris to try to catch up to Bishop Bronte and talk to him about being a missionary in America. So he arrived in Stroudsburg and Canon Reese confirmed the news that they no longer needed a German priest in Philadelphia and that he had no money to give to Newman for his trip, but that maybe there were some other people that would be happy to give him money. Some people at the time were very interested in the missionary work and were willing to support some of their, their trips. So Newman went on from Strasbourg to Nancy, where he spent four days with the Sisters of St. Charles before continuing to perish. There was another missionary who was bound for the United States, a priest named Schaefer, who was with him on the trip. Newman stayed for a month in Paris, buying books, seeing the sights, and Schaefer, his friend, received a letter from Bishop Bronte informing him that he himself would be accepted, but three other missionaries who had applied for a place in the Diocese of Vincennes, they were rejected. Now, nothing in the bishop's letter was mentioned of Newman. So the letters may have gone astray or crossed in the mail. So Newman decided to stay on longer, again, hoping to catch up to the bishop when he arrived in Paris. But as the weeks went on, Newman was really running out of money, and money from different places never materialized. So he decided he really didn't want to wait any longer to go to America because he was really confident that he would be able to get some sort of a job in the United States if maybe not in New York, maybe in Detroit or St. Louis. And worst case, he could return to New York until they did need someone with his qualifications. 
So he left Paris and he arrived in Le Havre because Le Havre was where all of the ships left. And that was in 1836. He, you had a choice of different vessels to sail on at that point in time. So he decided to take the largest vessel because to him it seemed like it would be less crowded. It took him four days to get on board. And during that four days, he spent his time in a parish church where he was reading and practicing his English and French with the locals. When he did finally make it on board the Europa, the voyage lasted for 40 days. They ended up in sight of land May 28th of 1836. But the ship remained outside of New York Harbor for three days because of bad weather and for sick people aboard to recover. At that point in time, if you were ill, the quarantine officials would not let you off the ship and you would have to be transported back to Europe. And none of the ships wanted to transport the people back. So they wanted to make sure that they were well or over their illnesses before they actually landed. So Newman asked the captain six times if he could get off of the ship and he was refused. But finally, he was let off in a rowboat on which he went to Staten Island. He did not go into Ellis Island. Several hours after that, he took a steamer into lower Manhattan. And so he did land in the U.S. on the Feast of Corpus Christi. He only had one suitcase with him and one dollar in his pocket at the time. So, of course, he once again wanted to find a Catholic church where he could begin to do his investigating as to how he could become uh, a member of the church. Now, remember, he still wasn't ordained. So there was a Swiss innkeeper who directed him to the church where Joseph Schneller gave him the, bishop, the address of Bishop Du Bois and a Father John Raffiner. Raffiner was the vicar general of the Germans in New York. And so John went right away and Father Ratner had sent a, that a note had been sent to Canon Race three weeks before saying that he had been accepted as a priest in the Diocese of New York. So they went to the home of the Bishop Du Bois and he was indeed in urgent need of German pastors. So he wanted him to be ordained immediately. He was perfectly happy with the guarantees of Newman's education in Europe, and he wanted him to be ordained as soon as possible. Newman asked for a little bit of time in order to prepare for his ordination, which the bishop granted because he himself had to leave for a visitation. And so when Newman told the bishop that he had no dismoral letters, that too was swept aside. Again, they were in such desperate need that they wanted him to be ordained quickly. So in the meantime, Father Raffner took Newman to his own parish, St. Nicholas, and put him to work teaching catechism to children who were preparing for their first communion. Du Bois called Newman 17 days after his arrival. He ordained him at St. Patrick's Old Cathedral in the subdeaconate on June 19th, to the deaconate on June 24th, and to the priesthood on June 25th. So it was done very, very quickly. And Newman celebrated his first mass the next morning at St. Nicholas. Now, the Diocese of New York at the time encompassed all of the state of New York and half of New Jersey. After his ordination, Du Bois assigned Newman to work with recent German immigrants in the Niagara Falls area, and there were no established parish churches. So his first assignment was the Church of St. Peter and Paul in Williamsville, New York. Again, that today, Williamsville is a suburb of Buffalo. 
and his parish in Western New York stretched from Lake Ontario to Pennsylvania. It was a very huge area. And because there was a lack of actual churches, Newman had to ride a horse throughout the countryside. And because he was short, his feet never re reached into the stirrups. So people always laughed when they saw him coming. But he did travel the countryside on horseback and he visited the sick and he taught catechism and he trained teachers to take over when he left. He finally took up full-time resident residence in Northbush, which is part of Tonawanda, as the first pastor of St. Pastor of St. John the Baptist. And he made that the base for his missionary work. Now in the upper right is a picture of the Church of St. Peter and Paul in Williamsville that is still there today. The blue sign that you see in front of the church commemorates the fact that St. John Newman did indeed work there. But because of the work and the isolation of his parish, Newman really longed for some sense of community. There weren't other priests there. There weren't other people for him to really talk to. So in, in 1840, with Du Bois' permission, Newman applied to join the Redemptorist Fathers. He was accepted and he entered their novitiate at St. Philomena's Church in Pittsburgh. He was the first candidate in the New World and he took his religious vows as a member of, the con of that congregation in Baltimore in 1842. He served in a number of different places. He was in Ohio before he went to New York. He became a naturalized US citizen in Baltimore. And he also served as a pastor in Maryland for a couple of years. After six years in Maryland, he became the provincial supervisor for the United States. He also served as a parish priest in Baltimore. In 1852, the Holy See appointed Newman Bishop of Philadelphia. His predecessor in that office presided over the consecration and then Bishop O'Reilly assisted. The consecration took place in St. Alphonsus Church in Baltimore. Now, the people in this particular area, some of them settled in the city, some settled in rural parts of the diocese. And so it was really similar to some of the rural areas that Newman had already been to during his ministry in New York State. So there were people at the time in Philadelphia. It was one of the largest cities in the country. And there was a lot of competition for jobs in Philadelphia. So these waves of immigrants that at the time were coming in to the country resulted in tensions in Philadelphia. There was tensions be between those that were native born and those who were coming in. And since a lot of the folks coming in were Catholic, there was a lot of anti-Catholic sentiment. There were a lot of anti-Catholic riots that took place in the 1830s and 1844. In Philadelphia, there was a nativist riots, and those were occurring as the Irish Catholics began to arrive in great numbers. And soon there were more riots, particularly since the city was a stronghold of the Know Nothing Political Party, which was known for its anti-immigrant and anti-Catholic prejudices. So during his administration, he did erect parish churches at an extraordinary rate. One per month, the churches were going up. However, in order to encourage savings and in order to support the financial needs of the growing church, Newman 
directed the creation of a mutual savings bank called the Beneficial Bank in 1853. Many immigrants settled in closed communities from their hometowns and with speakers of the same language. So churches really became associated with their particular region and they were known as national parishes. So you would have a German national parish, you would have an Italian national parish, you'd have a Polish national parish. So these parishioners often didn't speak any English and they really weren't sure how to get any type of social services. So this is where Newman's knowledge of so many different languages really helped in establishing all of these various churches. And because the parents of these children had a fear of Protestant influence and discrimination in the public schools, they really didn't know what, what school to send their children to. Newman recognized this, and he began to organize the diocesan school system which thrived in the 1800s. Now, the number of schools increased from one to 200 during the time that he was bishop. And he had no fear of ministering to new newcomers. Um, he spoke German and Italian fluently, and he would offer them pastoral care in his private chapel. Um, he invited religious institutes to establish new houses within the diocese to provide the services. In 1855, he supported the foundation of a congregation of religious sisters in the city, the Sisters of St. Francis. He brought the, so, the school sisters of Notre Dame from Germany to assist in religious instruction and to staff an orphanage. There was also a congregation of African-American women that was founded by Haitian refugees in Baltimore that were on the verge of being dissolved. And he stepped in and he saved them from being dissolved. So the large diocese, though, was not wealthy. And he personally became known for his frugality. He had one pair of boots throughout his entire residence in the United States. And back then, again, as now, when a new set of vestments is given to a priest as a gift, he wouldn't keep them for himself. He used them to outfit the newly ordained priests in his diocese. And he was very discouraged between the anti-Catholic riots and some of the churches were being burnt down. He did write to Rome asking to be replaced as bishop. But Pope Pius IX insisted that he continue. In 1854, he traveled to Rome and was president of St. Peter's Basilica when Pope Pius did institute the dogma of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And that was a very big deal. It was quite an honor to be able to go and to do that. While doing errands on a Thursday, January 5th in 1860, he collapsed and died on a Philadelphia street. He was 48 years old. Bishop James Frederick Wood succeeded him as the Bishop of Philadelphia. He was declared venerable by Pope Benedict XV in 1921. He was beatified by Pope Paul VI during the Second Vatican Council in 1963, and he was canonized by Pope Paul VI on June 19th of 1977. His feast day is January 5th, the date of his death, on the Roman calendar for the church in the United States, but on March 5th in the Czech Republic. After his canonization, the National Shrine of St. John Newman was constructed at the parish of St. Peter the Apostle. In 1980, 
Our Lady of the Angels College, which was founded by the Congregation of Franciscan Sisters, which he had founded and located within the Archdiocese, was renamed Newman College. It was granted university status by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in 2009. St. John, John Newman never lived at St. Peter's, but he was there regularly during his life. And as he was bishop of, when he was bishop of Philadelphia, he was there for retreats and recreational and pastoral activities. And he celebrated the midnight mass there just a few days before he died. At his funeral, at his, as his funeral services ended, the Redemptorist received his body and lowered him reverently into a grave in the basement of the church. They marked his tomb with a marble slab, a memorial that you can still see set in the sanctuary floor of the shrine, the lower church of St. Peter's. His body has remained at St. Peter's ever since, but not in the same place. If you were to visit the shrine today, the saint's body is now lying in state, enclosed in glass under the altar at the shrine. And those are the pictures of um, the St. Peter's Church. St. John Newman is invoked as a patron saint of sick children and of immigrants. And I thought it would be interesting to take a look at what are, who, who are the Redemptorists? Well, they are members of the Congregation of the Most Holy, Holy Redeemer, which is a community of Roman Catholic priests and lay brothers that was founded by St. Alphonsus in Italy, a small town near Naples in 1732. The infant community met, met an obstacle in the Royal Court of Naples, which tried to exercise complete control over the order. However, steps were taken to settle in the papal states, and after papal approval was granted by Pope Benedict XIV in 1749, was the success of the congregation assured. St. Clement extended the congregation into Northern Europe in 1785. And in 1832, the Redemptorists came to the United States, particularly to undertake the care of German Catholic immigrants. The congregation has since become established throughout the world. The community's special concern is the preaching of the word of God, especially to the poor, through various means, but particularly parish missions and retreats. The Redemptorists also administer parishes and foreign missions, serve as chaplains and military forces, and foster scholarships in the field of moral theology. They administer several shrines for pilgrimages worldwide and are the special caretakers of the Byzantine icon of our maid, mother of perpetual help in Rome. So you could see where now John Newman would pick this particular group to join because these were all of the things that he was really wanting to do with his career. And so it was the perfect group for him to join. And our closing prayer, grant, O Lord, that like your holy bishop, we may do all our work with the pure intention of pleasing you, and let not our deeds be done to win the favor of others, but to give glory to our Father in heaven. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed our presentation on St. John Newman. Next month, we will be doing Maximilian Colby on Thursday, February 4th at 11 a.m. You can sign up on the website or through our weekly update. 
we do do these presentations once a month on the first Thursday of every month. Thank you for listening. God bless.